we uh, are at the pinnacle of the Torah, uh, of the Pentateuch, the first five books in our Bible, um, the climax of Leviticus this morning as we look at the Day of Atonement. Um, I'm going to read uh, the first ten verses and then we'll kind of look at some of the other verses um, and as we unpack what's in here this morning. But if we start in, there we go, uh, Leviticus 16, verse 1, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they drew near before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil, before the mercy seat that is on the ark, so that he may not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. But in this way, Aaron shall come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat and shall have the linen undergarment on his body. And he shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. Then he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering, but the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel, or Azazel, either way you want to pronounce that, uh, shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. Okay, so as we get here this morning, um, as we have studied and have looked, you are probably um, most likely have the same kind of question uh, that is generated in my mind, um, is why is this day special? Um, why do we need another day of atonement? Uh, because as we have looked in Leviticus, we've been through the first seven chapters um, and further, but the first seven chapters we, we saw that there were five regular offerings and three of those um, already provided atonement. And so we talked about the Olah or the uh, ascension offering that is said to provide atonement that is offered twice every day, um, once in the morning and, and once in the evening, and the priest would offer those two offerings um, twice every day uh, for the whole nation of Israel. Uh, then we looked at the hatat or the, the sin offering, or uh, we, we said that's better described as a purification offering. And so uh, this was offered when someone uh, committed an unintentional sin, and, and we said we, we use those words kind of loosely because a lot of our sins are intentional, um, but unintentional means that they weren't high-handed sins, that it wasn't open defiance, rebellion uh, against God. I'm, I'm not going to listen to you, God, and um, no matter what your word says, I'm going to continue to do this, but it was... Um, something that was either unintentional or um, just a, an error, um, a, a time of a moment of, of weakness, a moment of, of rashness oftentimes, and, and so they would offer the hatat. Um, and then the third offering was the asham, and that was the guilt or the reparation offering. And so this was when there was, uh, if you remember, a betrayal of some kind, um, there was some kind of breach of, of covenant, either with God or um, 
a breach of covenant with your neighbor. And so if uh, I took something from Keith, uh, then I've sinned against God and I've sinned against Keith. And so I need to make a, a reparation offering. And, and so I would offer this animal, uh, but I would also pay Keith 20% of, of the value um, above whatever I ha- had taken from him. Um, so if I stole his lawnmower, I'd get a, give his lawnmower back plus 20% of, of the value of the lawnmower kind of deal. Um, and so since we have those, um, why is this particular or special kind of ceremony required? Why is it needed? And so there are a, a few... <coughs> I'm going to try to cover my coughs up the best I can. Uh, but there are a few possibilities that um, commentators and uh, scholars have put forth. Uh, First, that it could be that part of this ceremony atoned for unknown or unrealized sin. And so the idea is that the people um, need to be very diligent about um, seeking cleanliness, ritual purity, um, seeking moral purity, and so in that process through, throughout each year, they, they may have missed something. Um, maybe they've done something wrong and, and they won't realize it until much later. Uh, or maybe they just didn't realize they had sinned. Um, and, and they are, are atoning for sins that they uh, aren't sure about or, or, or didn't know of. And so it's kind of like the idea of picking out a, a dress shirt. Um, I, I know some of you have seen Amanda uh, scold me, I'll use that word, uh, on some Sundays, um, every Sunday, uh, because I, I'll pick out a shirt, and, and really, I'm, I've looked at the shirt, and I'm like, okay, this is okay, and I get here, and she's like, there's a spot on your shirt, um, I can't take you anywhere, because all your, all your clothes have spots on them. Um, And and so the idea is that you you may have missed that, um, and so that needs to be uh, addressed. Um, And and again, that kind of reiterates to us the the holiness of of God, because um, if if we've committed a sin and and we don't realize it until later, or or we're we're kind of ignorant uh, that we have committed a sin, um, God still sees that as a sin. Uh, that's still something that, that separates us. That's still us not acting as we are supposed to act. And so that, that needs to be dealt with. And so um, no sin is allowed in the, the presence of God. And so uh, this is a way um, that the people could ensure that nothing slips through the cracks, uh, that they don't miss something. Um, another possibility, second, it could be that this made... Uh, atonement possible for even those high-handed sins, uh, those sins that are very intentional. Um, The high-handed sins, if you remember, we we talked about those as kind of giving God the the finger and saying, you know, I'm adamant shaking your fist at God and and saying, I I don't follow you. I'm not going to be uh, obedient. I'm going to continue on through uh, with this way of thinking or with this kind of lifestyle or with this action. And so, uh, God, I, I know what you say, but I, I'm going to do this my way. And so in Numbers 15, uh, we read a description of those who have committed um, those high-handed sins, and, and God says, I, I'm going to cut those people off uh, from my people. Um, and so the, it says, His iniquity shall be upon him, the weight of his guilt um, He'll, he'll carry that, and it's a, a rejection of God, and so God is going to reject that person. Um, but if he or, or she repented, um, they could be forgiven. Uh, an example of, of that is seen in Leviticus 26, and we're not there yet. We're jumping ahead. But in Leviticus 26, God gives Israel a, a warning um, and kind of makes a a promise to them. It's a a warning and also an example of his faithfulness. Uh, He says that if Israel remains or walks in sin, if they walk in a way that is contrary to God, then God will cut down their idols uh, and God will abhor them. He will 
loathe them or, or separate himself from them. But if they will repent in humility and make amends, then they can be redeemed. And God will remember their covenant and will be their God. And so the key to that is if they uh, repent in humility and, and make amends, if they offer um, these offerings and, and go through this Day of Atonement. Um, and so both of these concepts have in view uh, that all sin is dealt with here on, on this day. And, and so we read that uh, in the text in 21, it says, And Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. And so you can see that everything... Uh, is atoned for all sin. Uh, and it, it uses three words, iniquity, uh, transgression, and, and sin. And those are really, I think I put this on. Yeah, I did. Uh, those are really the, the three condemning words or the three uh, kind of bad words in the Old Testament. And so iniquity uh, is the Hebrew awan, and it means bent or warped. Um, <clears throat> to transgress against God, a transgression is a pesha, and it means breaking loyalty or a breach of covenant with, with God. And then sin is katat, and it is failing to hit the target. Um, it's interesting because this word is also used um, when Joshua has some men, and, and um, he's training them with slingshots, and it says they, uh, God is with them, and so they can't kata, they can't miss the mark. It's, it's failing to hit a target. And so uh, this is why Israel needed atonement, um, and it's why we need atonement today, because um, we often have bent morals, uh, we have perverted desires, we have twisted values um, as we attempt to live uh, autonomous, apart from God, to, to be our own captain of our own ship, uh, to be our own authority in our lives, we often... Uh, have these bent desires, um, upside down kind of ways we, we think and, and view the world. Um, and then for transgressions, we, we do um, break loyalty. Uh, we have sins of, of commission, which is doing what God has said we ought not to do. Um, and so we have rebellion against God as a, an authority figure. And then uh, sin, failing to hit the target, uh, we have moral ineptitude. Uh, we often fail to do what we ought to do, and, and we uh, call that sins of omission when we um, don't do the things that we should be doing as image bearers of, of God, primarily loving God and, and loving our neighbor. And so when we neglect to um, help someone in need that we could help, and we say, no, nah, I'm not going to, to do that. I worked hard for this, and I'm not going to help them. And we uh, could do that. Sometimes those sins of omission, where we're, we're not doing what we should do. Um, and so on this day, all sin is atoned for. Uh, but what is interesting on this day is how sin is atoned for. And so this morning, we will look at some of the, the u unique uh, features of, of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, uh, mainly the, the pr procedure for the high priest, um, what is significant about these two goats, and then the obligations of, of the people and how the people um, should approach this day, the people of Israel, uh, because it's a, another picture. And so again, we're, we're, God is expanding um, the picture of what atonement is and what, how atonement works and, and what it does. Um, and it's primarily... Uh, revolves around two big theological nerd words, uh, and that is propitiation and expiation, okay? And so those are, are really big words, and you may not know what those mean, uh, but hopefully by the, the end of this morning you'll, you'll understand because the, the picture is so much simpler uh, to see than, than trying to explain things um, sometimes. 
So we're going to see a picture of both of those words this morning. And so I want to begin by looking at the uh, procedure of the high priest. And so uh, we want to notice that a priest begins by changing clothes. And and so this morning we might have to um, unlearn or relearn uh, some things when we we think about the the priestly garments. Um, On most days, the priest wore what is commonly called the, the golden garments. And so you can see... Uh, this image here, uh, he has the, the tunic, the belt. There's, there's eight pieces here that the priest would be wearing. Um, it's a, a very ornate um, uniform that he would wear on, on most days. It's very beautiful. It's, it's very uh, prestigious. And it has a, a kind of an air of, of nobility on it. And so he has the uh, golden diadem or, or this crown uh, on his head or around the turban that says holy to the Lord, on his uh, ephod, on the, the chest plate, he has these uh, precious gems. Um, and then on his robe around the bottom, you can see there were um, sewn in bales and, and pomegranates. And so uh, this is what the priest wore most days. Um, and it's often thought or taught that the, the priest wore this uniform into the Holy of Holies. Um, that the people would listen for the bells to ring, and if the bells had stopped ringing, then they would know the priest messed up and, and God had, had killed him um, while he was serving and doing his job on the, the Day of Atonement. Um, and then uh, along with that, there people have claimed that the, the priest would have a, a rope tied around his uh, waist or around his ankle. And so if they heard the bells stop, um, then they know he they knew he was dead, and they could drag him out of the the holy of holies by um, the rope and and so um, people that have have taught that um, are really emphasizing god 's holiness and uh, emphasizing the 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 somberness and the the seriousness of of kind of this ritual um, but we don 't see um, this happening in scripture. Uh, we just read that this morning. Um, there's no credible record of the practice of, of tying the, the rope uh, around the waist or the ankle. Uh, this was a, a rumor that kind of began in the, the 13th century in the Middle Ages. Um, it's not in the Old Testament. It's not in the New Testament. Uh, it's not in the, the Mishnah or the Apocrypha or the Pseudepigrapha. Um, it's, it's not mentioned in any of the Dead Sea Scrolls material. Um, and actually, it would have been problematic um, to have that rope tied around the, the waist or, or ankle uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, and this first one is a, a big one. Um, first, God didn't command it. And so it would be entering into the most holy place um, with something that God did not prescribe. And so we've already seen kind of how that panned out with Adab and Abihu, right? And and God killed them um, because they tried to approach on on their own terms. And so, um, you know, it's it's important to follow God's prescription, what God requires. And so God doesn't command that. um, So why would they dare attempt it? Um, the second reason that it would be problematic is because of the, the thickness of the veil. Um, we have curtains in many of our houses, and, and we think, okay, uh, you know, even at the, the when we do the Easter drama and the, the curtains close, um, you know, you can move the curtain and kind of walk through there. Um, the the veil for that separated the holy place and the, the most holy place um, was several uh, curtains interwoven that that kind of made almost like a maze because they would overlap um, and they were three feet thick uh, it was three feet thick of, of curtain material that they would have to navigate through um, to get into the holy of holies and so uh, it's not practical for them to be able to pull someone uh, through all of that maze and that thickness of, of fabric uh, to get them out with with a rope and so I just wanted to, to mention that. Um, because that that's kind of said sometimes, and, and I, I think people have good intentions. 
um, when they say things, but we just don't find any record of that. Um, thankfully, there is no record that the uh, high priest ever died um, while they were serving inside of the, the Holy of Holies. We also never see any mention of that. Um, that, too, would have definitely been recorded um, somewhere in Jewish history, and, and so nothing is ever mentioned about that. Um, but what we do know is the priest changed into uh, what is known as the, the fine linen or the, the holy garments. And so uh, instructions for both of these uniforms uh, are in Exodus 39. And, and so you can see that the, the holy garments or the fine linen is uh, much more simple. It's just a, a tunic, the belt, the turban, and, and the pants. And so there's only those four pieces, and it's not... Um, extravagant. Uh, it's much more uh, plain. And so the question that that should kind of generate in our minds is, is why the wardrobe change? Why is this um, something that God is requiring the priest to do? And so we can answer that if we think about what the priest is doing as a mediator. Um, most days, all but on Yom Kippur, uh, he is wearing the golden garments, and, and we uh, talked about this a few weeks ago. Uh, remember, the, the priest in these golden garments is serving as uh, an ambassador, a uh, representative of the king. And so there is this look of uh, nobility, this look of royalty. And, and now we can take this just a little bit further, okay? Um, it, it doesn't look like it to us today. Um, but if we think of ancient Near Eastern imagination, um, in, in fact, the priest to the people would almost look divine. Um, he would almost look like a deity. And he is representing a God who is king, who is crowned with a golden diadem. Um, he is representing this God, and, and this is such an awesome picture. Uh, he is representing this God that has the names of his people, um, engraved on his heart over his, his chest and these stones. And he's, he's representing God to the people. And so this is what the priest looks like when he is representing God, representing on the behalf of God to the people. And on the Day of Atonement, the picture is reversed. On this day, he will represent on behalf of the people before God as he goes into the Holy of Holies. And so this would require him not looking like a king, not looking like a deity, but looking like a servant. And so in humility, the priest strips himself of all of these ornate gems and all of the gold, and he lays all of that aside, and he wraps himself in what represents the people around him. And so the, the people, this, this looks more like the other Israelites. He's representing the people before God, and he strips himself of his royalty. And so we think about that, and, and where have we heard that language? In Philippians, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. In John we read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And then later we read, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And Matthew puts it this way, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. And all this place, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin 
shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So this wardrobe change is a hint of this future incarnation. So we have Christmas in Leviticus. So the people need a mediator who can represent God to them and who can represent them to God. And and Jesus is the God-man. He is the Son of God who took on human form, who was born of a virgin. And there are many times in the gospel where he shows and demonstrates his deity when he heals the sick, when he casts out demons, when he calms the storm, when he goes up to the mountain and is transfigured um, before the three apostles. But he also shows his humanity. So we also see that, that Jesus is, is tempted, but he doesn't sin. That when something happens and there's pain in his life, Jesus wept at the, the death of Lazarus. We see that Jesus experienced pain, that Jesus bled when he was cut, when he was whipped. And we see that he died for our sins on the cross. And then again, he shows his divinity because he defeats death and rises victorious from the grave. And so that's what we can see in in hindsight now. Um, And so the next question we we ask is, is what would these people have seen then? Um, So first they would be reminded that the priest is, is not perfect And we've we've seen that with some of the other offerings that um, the priest is a a sinner here. Uh, He can't just go into the Holy of Holies because he's a sinner. He has sin himself that needs to be atoned for. He is dependent too on God's atonement, on God's mercy and on his grace. And the second thing that they would have seen is that the way into God's presence involves Humility. And so for the priest, it does involve this stripping away of of something that is prestigious, of his nobility, of his royalty. Um, And for the people, it involved afflicting themselves. And so we see that later on in the chapter. Um, In verse 29, it says, And it shall be a statute to you forever, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict yourselves and shall do no work, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For on this day shall atonement be made to cleanse you. You shall be clean before the Lord from all your sins. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest to you, and you shall afflict yourselves. It is a statute forever. And so what does it mean for them to uh, afflict themselves? This doesn't mean uh, that they were to to cut themselves or, or... involve self-mutilation or anything like that, and we'll see that prohibited um, later on in Leviticus, but it does mean that they were to humiliate themselves, they were to uh, humble themselves, that they were to think about their their shame, that they were to think about um, and be embarrassed for how they have acted, for what they have done uh, against their neighbor and against God as they have sinned. It was a, a time for them to to reflect, um, to regret those actions. And it's also a, a time of, of fasting. And so uh, the people were to have this um, time during this day to reflect on their own sin, to, to confess that, uh, to repent of their sin, and, and we'll see more of that here in a little bit. Um, but it's also a time for them to rest. It's a reminder of, of God's rest. Um, it says it is a Sabbath of solemn rest to you there at the bottom. Um, the literal reading of that in Hebrew is that it is a Sabbath of Sabbaths. Uh, it's a, a superlative. And so um, you, the Bible uses this language to talk about the greatest. And so we talk about King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so this is the highest King. Uh, he is the highest Lord. And so God says this is the Sabbath of Sabbaths. This is the, the greatest rest for your life. This is the greatest rest for your soul. This is your, your greatest need, this day of atonement. 
And so after the high priest changed, um, he did offer a, a bull as a sin offering for himself and his household. And he would take a censer of the coals from the altar um, of burnt offering and he would uh, place incense on the altar of incense. And it was to be a, a pleasing aroma of the sacrifice uh, that would be almost kind of like a, a smoke screen um, for you that play Call of Duty, it's the smoke grenade, okay? So he would go into the, the Holy of Holies, and there's put the incense there, and it makes a, a smoke screen. And so this would shield the priest uh, from being exposed to God's full glory, uh, but it would also conceal the, the priest from God, in a sense. And so then the priest would apply the blood with his finger on the mercy seat, and he would sprinkle the blood seven times in front of the mercy seat. Um, and then what happens next involves these two goats. And so it's important to note that what happens here with these two goats is to be seen as being done in tandem, uh, that, they, that they're alongside of each other, that uh, they're combined. And so you have two goats, but the image that we're supposed to be seeing is um, these two goats represent kind of one goat, okay? So that's why they're mentioned together. Um, and even though things happen in order and in time, uh, the two goats are, are really showing us one picture. And so the high priest cast lots over the goats. Um, and so this is, is like um, drawing, slot, uh, drawing straws or, or flipping a coin. Um, it may uh, have involved the Urim and the Thummim. Um, but one goat is to be set aside for the Lord as a sin offering, and the other is to be for Azazel. Um, and that's, that's weird. We'll, we'll come back to that, I, I promised. Um, but the, the goat that is designated for the Lord is, is killed as an offering for sin. And so this goat's blood is sprinkled inside of the Holy of Holies. Then it is uh, put on the incense altar and then finally, the horns of the altar of burnt offering. And so uh, this is to make atonement for the holy place. And that kind of sounds weird. Why does the holy place, why, why does it need atonement? And so again, uh, the idea is that God's people, Israel, um, they are sinners. There is uncleanliness. There is ritual impurity and there is sin that, that happens even in the camp. And so to... To clean that, God is, is cleaning the camp uh, from the inside out. The, the idea is that uh, sin, the sin of the people, has been lingering, and it has slowly been, been building up in his presence um, because his, his people are unclean, his, sin, uh, his people sin against him, and so God is, is purifying his domain. He's sweeping sin out of the door, um, and, and we see this picture, God is... is uh, the high priest starts at the, the Holy of Holies, which is the, the west side, and then everything is, he's moving towards the east and applying the blood, and so um, I forgot to get a broom. I meant to get a broom, um, but it's it's kind of like sweeping your house um, or, or mopping the floor. You know, you have to, to teach kids how to do that um, so you don't go into the corner and box yourself in. You're, you're going towards uh, one way, and you're sweeping things out of a room, and so God is clean, cleaning, uh, cleansing uh, His domain, His tent, and He's He's moving sin out of the camp. Okay, and so uh, then the live goat is brought uh, out that will be sent to uh, Azazel. I'm going to say that two different ways. It's okay. Um, three different thoughts re regarding Azazel. Uh, and, and they will all sound a little bit different, but I, I want you to hear there's a, a common theme here, okay? Because that's what we, we want to, to focus on. Um, and so the first is, um, some think that Azazel is a demon that is in the wilderness. And so the idea is that you are loading this goat up with impurity and sending it into an unclean realm, an unclean sphere. And so... Uh, the problem with that is in, in the next chapter, God says not to, to sacrifice to goat demons. And we'll see that next week. Um, but this isn't said to, to be a, a sacrifice. It's just a, a sending away. 
um, sending the goat into demon country um, is kind of the picture that we get here. Uh, the second opinion is that it is thought that the word Azazel means rough, rocky place. Um, and, and really, that's the problem. We, we, we don't know what this word means, okay? And so that's why people have come up with different things and um, different theories for this because they've looked at this word and, and tried to decipher it. Um, and so um, here it may be related to an Arabic word, uh, azu. Hold on, I got to get it in my mind. Azazu, sorry. Uh, and, and that word means cliffside. Um, and so the, the thought is that it would be this rocky cliffside where the goat would be t- uh, destroyed. And in the temple period, um, they would actually take that goat um, to a rocky cliff and throw the goat off. Um, so the goat would, would die because there historically had been a case where the goat came back into the camp. Um, and they had to drive the, the goat away again. Um, here in the, the tabernacle period, uh, that man that is in readiness would, would take the goat like 12 to 20 miles uh, into the wilderness, way outside of the camp, uh, and release it. And then the, uh, the final option is that Azazel is a combination of, of two words. Uh, Ez meaning goat, and Azel meaning sent away. And so this is where many of your translations, King James Version, um, kind of coined the word scapegoat. And the ESV uh, transliterates this and instead of, of putting scapegoat. Uh, the Greek Septuagint uh, translated, translates it as aphesin. Um, and that is really interesting too because it, it means the goat of pardon uh, or the goat of forgiveness. And so... Um, Again, the common idea that you can see in, in any of those uh, theories is removal and exile. Okay, So that's the, the picture that we, we want to focus on. Um, this goat will bear the people's iniquity. Their sin is placed upon him and then he is exiled outside the camp. And so um, many translations say... Uh, the goat is to go free in the wilderness, and, and that kind of um, creates a, a positive view. And, and some people will say, and, and we get to go free in the wilderness. That's not the, the picture that it's showing. Um, this, is, this is an exile. This is uh, the phrase set free, and the ESV is actually translated in Genesis 3.23 uh, as sent away. So this is God sending away uh, the sin, and so it is being removed. Um, the sinners were removed from the garden; they were sent away. Uh, so the garden is purified, and here um, God is removing sin from sinners. So the the sinner is purified, and so this is why uh, confession over the goat was required. It, it was a transfer of sin, as the the high priest laid both hands on the animal. And confess the, the iniquity, the transgression, the sin of the people. Uh, so that sin and iniquity and transgression could be carried away outside of the camp. So what did they, what did they pray? Uh, how did they confess? How did they repent? Um, they left no stone unturned. Uh, over time, this developed into uh, the vidu. Uh, it is a, a Jewish kind of prayer liturgy. Uh, it's a prayer from Aleph to Tav, which is... Um, in the Hebrew alphabet, that's like saying from A to Z. And so each line in this prayer um, would say something that, that people are, are guilty of and how we sin uh, against God. Um, and it's originally based on a, a prayer in Daniel 9. And uh, I wanted to read that this morning um, and, and listen to this. And, and, and we could kind of pray these same things uh, this morning. Um, it says, I prayed to the Lord, my God, and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled. Turning aside from your commandments and rules, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness. But to us, open shame. 
as at this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away and all the lands to which you have driven them because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants and the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your your voice. And the curse and the oath that were written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. And then Daniel moves on and says, Now therefore, O God, listen to the prayer of your servant and his pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, O Lord, make your face shine upon your sanctuary which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city that is called by your name, for we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. And so the people would have prayed something like this. God, we have sinned against you. God, we are are wicked. There's wickedness in our our heart. We've acted wickedly. We have ignored your word and disregarded your law. We're treacherous. We deserve punishment. We deserve open shame. We should be embarrassed about how we have acted. But God, because of your righteousness, because of your mercy and, and your grace, God, we ask for forgiveness. And all of their sin is removed from the camp. It is sent into exile. The sins of the previous year are no longer to be seen or remembered. They're they're cast away. And so condemnation and, and guilt, all of that is laid upon the scapegoat, the goat of pardon. And so this is the, the picture that they would see um, each and every year. And it's a a beautiful picture, but it is limited. It provided atonement, but it was only temporary. It had to be repeated year after year. And so we see here it's it's like a a payment plan. It's like a, a mortgage that they could never pay in full. And so it would have to be repeated every year. So this is more like um, atonement for rent rather than atonement purchased. And so that is until we get to Jesus who fulfills this entire procedure because he is the perfect and and final mediator between God and man as God incarnate. And so he, he doesn't enter into the Holy of Holies through the blood of bulls, but he enters by his own perfect blood because he is humanity with without blemish. He's without sin. He's also the the perfect sacrifice to atone for sin. And John writes in his gospel, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. His sacrifice purchased forgiveness for eternity. Finally, uh, once and for all, and Jesus on the cross reminds us of that when he says it's finished. You don't have to do this sacrificial system anymore. I've, I've paid it in full. And Jesus is also the, the scapegoat who is executed outside the camp. And we see that again on the cross when he says, Father, why have you forsaken me? Isaiah says that God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And we read in the Psalms, as far as the east is from the west, our sin has been removed. Our transgressions have been removed. We've been forgiven. And so I I hope you can see in that picture uh, those two big theological words of of propitiation and expiation. So propitiation is Jesus atoning for our sin by laying down 
his life and his blood covers our sin and we can be forgiven through his blood. And then expiation is now that sin is removed, just like the, the goat is exiled and sent away from the camp and, and say, uh, he goes out of sight and the idea is you, you can't see your sin anymore. And so Jesus removes our sin. We no longer have to carry the guilt and the weight of our sin. So the question again this morning is, have you experienced God's forgiveness? Have you experienced that uh, redemption through Jesus? Have you experienced being restored by what Jesus has done? And the way we do that, if you haven't done that, is to, to come by faith, to come in humility and dependence, to admit, yes, I, I have sinned. I, I've messed up. I've made mistakes. I haven't loved my neighbor like I should. I haven't been a, a, a husband like I should, a father like I should, or a son or daughter or a, a wife like I should. I haven't been the, the, the worker that I, ha- that I should be. I haven't treated people um, like they should be treated. And I've rebelled against God. I haven't um, pursued Him like I should. I haven't loved Him like I should. And you admit that to God, that you are a sinner that needs forgiveness from God. And then you trust by faith that Jesus gave his life to purchase your forgiveness and that he rose again from the grave to to give you new life, that you can be born again, led by the Spirit, following him, listening to to his wisdom, his instruction, his authority that we find in God's word. The final step in this ceremony was to uh, present a burnt offering. And again, the, the picture is entrusting yourself to God giving your entire self to God, his trusting in his provision and his purpose for your life, his authority, giving yourself to his service. Um, that doesn't mean that your, your life will be perfect. Um, everyone in here that is a believer can, can testify to that. We're still going to make mistakes. We're still going to mess up. But you can continue to rest that uh, Jesus provided atonement once and for all. That God sees you clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And so, I end by saying that if you haven't called on the name of the Lord, please do that. And then for those of us that that are believers, um, to think about and reflect on this this week, uh, about how Jesus has has paid for our sin, and think about that image of the, the scapegoat, the goat going out into the wilderness, our sin is, is not to be remembered anymore. Um, a lot of times we, we beat ourselves up. And uh, I think I've said this before, but sometimes we have a harder time forgiving ourselves than God does forgiving us. Um, and, and we need to let it go. We need to say, I, I don't need to forgive myself because God has forgiven me and his opinion matters more than mine. It does. And, and Jesus paid for our sins and we can leave um, all of that at the foot of the cross and, and, and walk each day um, knowing that we are secure, knowing that we're forgiven and uh, sharing God's love with other people and letting them know that, that they can have that peace, they can have that security um, too. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and... Uh, just these pictures that we keep seeing over and over uh, through these rituals in Leviticus and how you continue to to teach us about atonement, um, to teach us about salvation and what Jesus accomplished on the cross uh, for us that, uh, God, we deserved. But we're so thankful for your mercy and your grace that you pursue us, that you love us, and uh, made the salvation possible uh, just as a gift to be received, and we thank you for that, and uh, help us to share that with other people around us, Um, not just to come in here week after week and then go back and, and kind of put you to the side. Uh, until next Sunday, but God, we we pray that you are um, 
at the center of who we are in our daily interactions with people and uh, the desires that we have, the, the thoughts that we have, um, that, that we continue to, uh, as Scott talked about in Sunday school this morning, to, to meditate on your word and uh, that it would influence how we live. God, we love you, and we thank you for all that you do. Um, be with our mission partners and um, continue to, to help them uh, where they're at in, in their building process. Uh, give them good weather and uh, keep everyone safe and, and be with um, the house churches in Japan and um, those believers that are, are meeting together and, and sharing with their friends and neighbors and family. And uh, God, be with those our church family this week that are, are sick and uh, just restore their health and um, just help us to uplift and encourage one another and remind each other of your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.